All right. Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. Welcome to the third day of um, the TFOS Lifestyle Reports webinar series brought to you by um, CEFI. Um, today, we'll be focusing on the impact of environmental conditions on the ocular surface. Um, this is the third day, and today we have Dr. Penny Aspel um, with us. She um, served on the Environmental Conditions Subcommittee. Um, Dr. Penny is committed to improving um, sight and empowering lives through contribution to education, mentoring, clinical and translational research. Um, she has held um, tenured professional um, professorship positions at the Mount Sinai um, in New York. Um, she's also um, at the UTS, um, UTSC in Memphis, and she has leadership positions in um, several academia and professional societies. Um, some of these include um, being the president of the WIO Incorporated. Um, she's also the president of the CL. AO. Um, she's the editor-in-chief of the ECLA. Um, that's the ECLA journal. That's the Iron Contact Lens Journal, I guess. And um, she's also the inaugural um, editor for the Cornea section of the AAO iWiki and has been the study chair and the principal investigator for clinical trials such as the hepatic eye disease study, um, the DREAM study, INTAX, cross-linking, the AMOS study. Um, she's published over 300 peer-reviewed um, articles. We're very honored to have you here today, and we thank you so much for taking out the time to do this. Um, so I'm going to stop sharing my screen, and then you can go ahead with, um, take it away and share your screen. Okay, thank you. Uh, okay, just see. So I'm going to start share screening. Let's see if I can get it here. Here we go. And let me know if you can see the screen. I hope you can. Yes, we can see your screen. Okay. Well, thank you so much, for, um, um, Obi Wan, for inviting me. It's my pleasure to participate in your your uh, lecture series, and it's certainly was fun to be part of the TFOS uh, system. So I'm going to start with a few slides, just giving you the overview, which you might have already had in some of the other talks, but just so you understand the context. So my goal today is trying to give you some of the flavor of the information we gathered on the environmental conditions and how they might affect the ocular surface. Um, and then also give you some ideas of some research things that you might want to explore to understand this topic. Further. Okay, so first of all, um, I, let's start in with um, the slides here. If you can't hear or something, please let me know. These are my disclosures, nothing specific related to this, but I work with a lot of companies in developing protocols, for clinical trials, that's really one of my areas of interest, is how to make the clinical trials more effective in terms of determining safety and efficacy. And it's great fun and I enjoy doing it. So I'm involved in a lot of different companies as well as our, our research people. Um, a lot of people, as um, was just mentioned, were involved in TFOS. A really, I must say, a really awful picture of myself, but this was our team for the environmental um, diseases. Um, what I... What we did was, and, and it's worth trying to figure out here a little bit. Let me just, uh, what's happening with the slides here? Okay, there's two ways uh, or several different ways that you can look at data. So, you know, the TFOS reports are not new material. We're reviewing what's already been presented and published. And one of the things that we often do, including myself, are narrative reviews, where we take a topic, in this case, we're talking about environmental influence on the ocular surface, and we do a broad look at that topic, see what, gather the information that's um, available, um, try to figure out whether it's um, collected in a, uh, unbiased way if possible, and then coordinate that information into a report. Um, in addition, TFOS in each of the committees, and I was on the environmental committee, we looked to a systematic review. This is taking a key question and trying to answer that question. And this is a little bit different. We're focusing in very specifically on one question and how to answer it. So it's not everything about that topic. It's the one question. So we did a little bit of both in the environmental and the other committees as well. So I'm going to talk today about environmental conditions and the subcommittee report and start out with our first part, the introduction. Um, first of all, we looked um, 
you know, when you have big topics like this, environmental conditions, you sort of want to group it. So we grouped it into climate factors, as shown here, over here, and pollutants. Climate factors being things like sunlight, temperature, humidity, wind speed, um, vapors. And then the pollutants, the things that we associate with air pollution. And then certainly the things that cause allergies as well, um, uh, which can be many things and dependent on the part of the world you're living in and the temperature, etc. Um, one of the things to think about, however, is that outdoor and indoor conditions are not ex mutually exclusive. Um, actually, in Africa, those may be very combined when people live in uh, a setting where they don't have, you know, very firm, um, in, you know, separation between outdoor and indoor. The two environments uh, may combine really into one big environment. But no matter what type of uh, living situation someone's in, we open the door, we open the windows, and the outdoor and indoor or do get combined to affect the ocular surface. So we often um, look at them at one or the other, but really it's an interaction of the two that affects the um, surface of the eye. Um, the scope of our Committee on Environmental Influences included looking at risk factors that impact the ocular surface, um, looking at the climate-related temperature, humidity, wind, altitude, dew point, ultraviolet light, and um, things that can cause allergies. Outdoor and indoor pollution we mentioned, and the various things that might impact that as well. And then we had a third section which looked at specific ocular diseases that we feel environment particularly impacts dry eye disease, allergy, pterygium, chemical and thermal exposure, and also degenerative and neoplastic um, diseases. Okay, so let's talk about risk factors to begin with. Um, I'm not sure where this picture was taken, but it might, I haven't been at the opportunity to visit Africa, to be quite honest, but it might look a little bit like someplace that you live or visit um, in your um, area of the world. Uh, where climate can be very dry in some areas and very wet in others. I looked this up on the internet at the uh, uh, website listed on the bottom, and they describe Nigeria, which I our host is from, so may, perhaps more of our audience is from that part of Africa. I am not sure, actually. Um, but they divide Nigeria into three climate zones, a, a tropical monsoon-type climate zone in the south, a tropical savanna climate zone in the central area of the country, and a Sahelian hot and semi-arid climate in the north. Um, so there's sort of, you're going to see different environmental influences in these different zones of the country. And my guess is in the other parts of Africa, you'll also see variation depending on, it's not just one country has one climate. That's probably not true in most of the countries, frankly. Um, including here in the United States as well. Uh, the temperature in Nigeria um, is on average 29.9 centigrade. We, uh, we usually report temperature in fa uh, Fahrenheit in the United States, and this is about 86, which is considered quite hot. I live in Memphis, Tennessee, which is in the Mid-South, um, and we often in the winter, in the summertime, get up to 90 or above. So we're used to hot temperatures, but that sounds like that's um, um, uh, not uncommon in this part of Africa and maybe other areas as well. Um, interestingly, when you look at the precipitation, however, this is specific for Nigeria, it's relatively low, 1.1 uh, millimeters, with the greatest amount April to October. Again, from this website, I acquired this information. Um, so we know that temperature might affect the ocular surface. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, particularly in the homeostasis of that surface, either directly or indirectly. Um, what's interesting is dry eye disease, here abbreviated DED, dry eye disease, um, extremely high or extremely low temperatures, whether outdoor or indoor, can affect um, dry eye disease. Another interesting thing is trachoma. Um, I don't know um, how common that is in Nigeria this, these days. As you probably know, historically, trachoma was extremely common in Africa, um, in some areas, it has um, been well uh, treated and is uh, relatively rare, but it continues to be an issue for um, a good many people in Africa. Uh, temperature variations can affect allergic conjunctivitis as well. <clears throat> this is uh, from a website that I was able to get about temperature. What you can see is in Nigeria, again, this part of Africa in general, um, uh, the temperature is pretty hot. Uh, this is looking over a couple of decades, 1991 to 2020, and you can see uh, the, the low temperature and the high temperature. 
Low temperature is still pretty warm in the 20 degrees centigrade range, and the high temperature can be as high as 36 degrees uh, centigrade, with the average being the line in between. So it's pretty warm climate. It's probably, I don't need to tell you if you're um, living and enjoying uh, being, um, being there. Um, and the precipitation varies quite a bit throughout the year, with definitely a rainy season, um, as we see, um, from June to October. Um, this is a map that I just acquired um, recently of trachoma um, and showing where trachoma exists. Um, I didn't get a chance to check what year they're reporting on. Um, I think it's relatively recent, but I do not have the exact year offhand. Um, but you can see with the red being an area of high trachoma, there's still pockets depending what part you're looking at in Africa, where trachoma is not, um, has not yet been eradicated. So um, that's certainly affected by the um, environment. Uh, we know that uh, flies can spread the disease from person to person, and that high heat is one of the um, potential uh, aggravating factors for um, uh, leading to more trachoma. Um, humidity. Um, it, we did a study actually in the United States on humidity and found as in this first bullet here that humidity um, does affect dry disease. So there, it's sort of a reverse, higher humidity, less dry eye disease, a reverse relationship of the two. So low relative humidity is more ocular irritation more alteration in the uh, tear film and can be exacerbated during visual display unit work. We know when you look at a computer, you actually blink, blink less frequently. So even if you don't have dry eyes, you may actually not be spreading the tears. We're aware that to spread tears on the ocular surface, you must blink. So if somebody doesn't blink, uh, which may occur because they've had a stroke, unfortunately, or may occur because they have a Bell's palsy with a nerve affecting the uh, cranial nerve seven and they don't have a normal blink. Uh, they may not wet the surface of the eye and that surface is going to get dry. The lids and their function are um, essential for keeping that surface moist and wet. So humidity, whether it's um, from the atmosphere, low humidity is gonna impact that ocular surface and make it perhaps um, appear and feel more dry. Um, so here it is, a higher humidity, 30 to 40% is going to be associated with lower ocular surface disease uh, symptoms. Moisture goggles can help. I have a feeling the humidity is pretty high in a good part of Nigeria, but we also know there's areas that are desert-like, both in that country and others, where the humidity is going to be very low, and those patients may be more impacted um, by dry eye symptoms. Um, allergic and viral infections also negatively correlate with relative humidity. So um, high, um, uh, that, that can be an issue as well. Uh, this is rainfall for precipitation. And again, you can see it depends what part you're looking at in this, in this part of Africa. It varies a great deal. Um, as, as well, you know, Africa is a huge continent and uh, the rainfall is gonna vary a great deal depending where you are and the patients where they live. Um, but it is um, um, definitely an issue in terms of low rainfall in significant parts of um, Africa. Wind speed, you know, there's very little literature about wind speed and its effect on ocular surface disease. Those of us who have been out in the wind, however, know that high wind speeds uh, here in the United States, that may just be a normal storm. I live in Memphis where we get actually uh, tornadoes. Um, hopefully we're never sitting in one of those. Those can be quite uh, um, uh, 200 miles per hour wind speed, very high and often very destructive. But we still get wind, much less than that, and that can affect the ocular surface. But interesting, there isn't much literature actually discussing that specific issues. Uh, there's a few case reports, but not too much. Um, you know, frostbite can happen even in the cornea, the front window of the eye. Uh, the one that stands out in my memory in terms of the limited information reported were people who went hiking on Mount Everest, obviously very high up, what is it, 22,000 feet or so, uh, 22,000 feet, miles high up into the atmosphere, very cold up there, obviously. And um, uh, there are people who had eye surgery, radial keratotomy, which was done to correct nearsightedness, myopia. I don't think it's done anymore, but there are people who've had um, their vision totally changed up there as the cornea shape changed with the very cold weather. 
on that's a pretty extreme. It's pretty extreme to be on the top of Mount Everest, and it's also a little unusual to have had that uh, RK surgery and be up there as well. Um, but that can occur. Um, I don't know if you're going to get frostbite any place in Africa. That level of um, a cold temperature. Um, persisting. Um, it's happened also in military uh, personnel and parachutists who it's very cold when they first get out of the plane and their corneas can freeze there. Um, this was an unusual report of a higher occurrence of corneal ulcers and people were harvesting onions in Taiwan during the monsoon region. Um, I don't know what to take from that report other than um, uh, ulcers are certainly associated with Uh, doing agricultural work, um, maybe having um, high humidity of the monsoon doesn't help the situation um, in that case. Altitude. I would say the biggest area of altitude um, in terms of the ocular surface is the ultraviolet radiation, which is higher as you go up in altitude, uh, not just a couple of floors, but at, like we're talking about on a mountaintop. You also have less oxygen as well. Um, so all of these probably impact on the ocular surface um, and the diseases we see associated with altitude are like pterygium, primarily associated with ultraviolet exposure, um, but also cataracts. The one risk factor that's been found for cataracts is um, ultraviolet exposure, primarily with um, anterior um, uh, Uh, nuclear cataracts, you know, cortical cataracts, not so much the nuclear sclerosis. So, and those fortunately are usually less visually um, uh, uh, degrading the anterior uh, cortical cataracts, but they seem to be associated with ultraviolet um, uh, light exposure. And of course we see dry eyes as well. Um, uh, if it's an acute exposure to um, uh, ultraviolet light, then we get that photokeratitis. Uh, the dew point measures um, uh, what temperature you get the air full, uh, so it's you know fully saturated, um, and that uh, full saturation or a high dew point is um, correlated with the tear breakup time, um, and may lead to protecting the ocular surface by keeping it wet and moist. So pterygiums. Um, I be interested, you know, it's hard on Zoom to get the feedback from our audience, but I'm assuming you do see pterygiums in your practice. Uh, pterygium, yeah, we do. It's not uncommon, probably. It's pretty common in the United States, too. In the United States, we see more pterygium in the more southern parts uh, where it is warmer, um, closer to the um, equator. But we also see an ethnic variation. We see more pterygiums in people of Hispanic or Latino um, ethnicity, um, and I'm not sure why. On the other hand, if you look at pterygiums across the world, I don't know any culture that does not have pterygiums. So we see it pretty frequently in every part of the world. It's a common um, problem, uh, and it often affects um, outdoor workers, construction workers. Uh, we also see in the United States, particularly in Hawaii, people who do like to surf. I don't know, do they do surfing near in Nigeria? I'm not sure. No, A little bit or no? No, no, there's no... No surfing in Nigeria. More in the um, South Africa area, is that where they do the More surfing? More in South Africa. Well, in some beaches in Ni in Lagos, um, in Nigeria, okay. yes, but it's not that common, but more in South That's Africa, yes. Okay. Well, I do not do surfing, so I'm not up to which beaches are the best, but I know that Africa has some that are considered world-renowned for their size and their waves. Anyway, surfers like to spend a lot of time out there, and they are prone, um, no matter what ethnicity, um, what uh, what age, of getting to rigid. Um, uh, we talked about ultraviolet acute exposure and photokeratitis, quite painful. Um, but usually resolves um, over a few days. Um, and then malignancies themselves on the ocular surface may be associated with um, ultraviolet and also a uh, process called climactic droplet keratopathy. So first, we got to understand a little bit of the UV index scale. Um, and it's usually rated starting at zero, very little UV exposure, up to over 11 being extreme. But note that the six to seven range, that number range, is associated, considered a high exposure number. Six to seven is high, zero is low, 
obviously 11 plus is extreme, but six to seven is still considered high. And then we take a look at what's going on in Nigeria. Again, it depends on the time of the year, but at the high time, which is March, April, around that time, you're getting up to seven, which was considered extreme exposure for UV. And then it gets a little bit better down to the three on average during August, September. So on there's still significant exposure to ultraviolet. I don't know how often people wear sunglasses there to protect their eyes. Um, that's becoming a more common um, utilization just to protect the eyes, not just for glare, but also to protect the eyes to use um, uh, sunglasses. By the way, the density of the color does not determine whether it's UV blocking. If UV blocking is by the material, it can even be a clear glass and block UV light. So you actually have to know the material to know whether it's UV blocking, not just by the sunglasses that have a dark color, but actually have to look at the quality of the material and whether it blocks ultraviolet light. Okay, there's all sorts of things that can cause allergies, right? Indoors, outdoors, uh, grasses, weeds, tree pollen, house dust. Um, and we were talking about pets, um, Dr. Obawani and myself, we both own dogs. Uh, they can bring in um, uh, things that cause allergies. And there are uh, the dander or part of their fur can very often cause allergies. In fact, I'm allergic to cats. Fortunately, not dogs, which I own. Okay. Um, pollution. Pollution is getting a lot of publicity these days uh, because it's uh, we kind of rather not have it, frankly. Um, and we're thinking about ways to decrease air pollution from the things that man does, whether it's um, fuels we use, um, devices such as cars that we use, et cetera. Um, so urban pollution is something that we think about. Um, actually, you know, if it's, I don't know, you'll have to tell me about Africa and different parts of it, but um, in our, some of our major cities, there's a lot of pollution. Not too many years ago, I visited and spoke in China and traveled around a bit with my daughter. And we were in Beijing, on um, which we, enjoy, we enjoyed our visit to China very much. And uh, one of our uh, hosts was telling us that they, this is some years ago, so they may have gone ahead with their plans. But here in Beijing, their big city, they were planning to build the world's largest um, uh, uh, Ferris wheel. You know, the wheels that go around, you can have chairs on them and people can go round and round and get an incredible view usually of the surrounding area because they're way high up. And they were saying that they were going to bring a, build a Ferris wheel that was high enough so from the top you could see the Great Wall of China, which is somewhat outside of Beijing. Not usually, you know, you can't see it from the city, but it was going to be so high that you could see the wall from the top of the uh, Ferris wheel. And we said, really? Because it's kind of hard to see the next building in Beijing. We kind of didn't think they'd get that far out. Um, so I don't know if they made it or not. I haven't been back in some years. Maybe they've, um, the air quality has changed. But some cities, it's really quite noticeable, even as a visitor or a temporary person being there. Um, we look at a couple of things, carbon monoxide, uh, nitrogen dioxide, sulfur dioxide, and ozone. Um, a common way of measuring urban pollution is PM or particulate matter. Um, this could be valved from volcanoes, from forest fires, from man-made sources like fuel, factories, agriculture. Uh, could be from air conditioning. Um, and so you'll see things, reports on PM. Um, I think if you um, use, probably do a cell phone, there's some report, um, I think on my cell phone, I'm going to take a quick look here. Um, I think it gives me every single day the PM in my area of the country. And I'm going to double check just to let you know what it is here. I think it actually gives me a number. Um, yeah, I think right now it's saying 47. I have to check to see that's the air quality. It may encompass other factors as well. But it's one of the ways that they report local um, urban pollution is PM. Um, and so there are studies looking at um, urban pollution and dry disease. And it's been associated with um, Sjogren's syndrome, the syndrome that associates dry eyes, dry mouth, and also systemic um, inflammatory diseases, such as arthritis altogether. And that, that too is associated with uh, pollution. So this is a study from the TFOS report, looking at um, uh, pollution and ocular surface and the reports that have been published worldwide. And as you can see, there's actually 
the greatest number, interesting enough, is here in India and Southeast Asia, less so, one in um, Africa, but less so in other parts of the world. So it's an area that we um, um, I'm encouraging um, um, those of you who live in Africa to maybe look at. It doesn't seem to be as much literature out of the Africa area. This is a figure I got from a um, internet um, website listed on the bottom here, looking at the um, a particular matter, small size, 2.5, concentration in different large cities. So um, with the highest being here, <clears throat> they're saying, actually, I told you that I was at, um, my number, local number was in the 40s, so I would have been around here. I'm not a large city, by the way. Memphis isn't that big. Um, but what's interesting is I spent most of my life in New York City, and they're purporting that that's kind of low. I don't think it's that low. But um, that's what they're saying from this particular report. And I'm not sure, we'd have to go back to the website if it gives the year. Um, I'm sure it does, but I don't see the, uh, the information listed here. So what's interesting is Delhi, Delhi in India is very high. And that I've been there, it does seem like there's a lot of urban uh, pollution there. I'm not sure exactly of the source, to be honest. Um, but you can see I put in a uh, color here, um, Lagos um, being somewhere, you know, fairly high, but not the highest. So I'm sure there's uh, reports like this for all parts of Africa, at least the major cities. But I think that would be an interesting um, study. You may find that your government agency reports the particular matter in the air each day. Actually, you know, in other words, you could go to a website. So you're, if you were interested in doing research, you could use your government agency website and use the data they report to give a summary of what happened over the last year or a couple of years. Um, I see there are some questions. I don't know if we want to catch them as we go. Um, I'm sorry. They... Um, we'll take questions after the webinar. Oh, at the end? Okay, fine. I'll quite turn that off for the moment. So, but yeah. it's interesting to see that. So one of the things is these um, presentations should, I sh hopefully will encourage, is that you might think of creating information about your own um, area where you live and work and your patient base, because that's how we learn, by sharing information, um, gathering the information, and then sharing it through presentations and publications. So let's keep going here. Uh, let's see if I got something going here. Okay, I don't think you have too much volcanoes in Africa, though I could be wrong there. It's been a big thing in certain parts of the United States. Mount St. Helen is out in the West Coast in the state of Washington. And then we've heard lately about um, volcanoes in uh, Japan um, and also in um, uh, Iceland. Um, and uh, countries up there. So it definitely is, it can even affect, if it's enough of a volcano, it goes into the air and can affect and interfere even with airplane travel, not just pollution, but inability of planes to fly through that uh, thick um, uh, uh, atmosphere that has a volcanic ash in it. Um, one thing I wanted to ask you, and may, I don't know if you know the answer, is dust is associated a lot with coal use of coal for fuel. I don't know what the main fuel um, usage is for everyday living needs is in Nigeria or other parts of Africa. Do they still use um, a lot of coal? So in the urban areas, um, mostly it would be um, gas or um, other refined fuels. Um, mm -hmm. But in the rural areas, pretty much there's still the use of coal um, or um, other natural sources such as wood and things like that. And so in those areas where they're still using a lot of coal, it does give a lot of pollution. So when mm -hmm. um, I, um, when we, again, I'm back to China. I don't know. I'm not picking on China. Please don't think I'm doing that. I'm just trying to relate some of my personal experiences with environmental influences. We, when we were in China, uh, we visited Xi'an, which is another one of their big cities. And if you have a chance to go to China, definitely go to Xi'an. That's where they have the terracotta 
warriors, these massive number of formations out of um, kind of a pottery of warriors, each looking different. They're not the same. Usually when we see a lot of old um, art, everything looks the same. Each warrior is individualized. And there's, there's hundreds, if not thousands of them that were underground and they've managed to locate them. Uh, and they're called the terracotta warriors. Anyway, definitely worth visiting if you happen to go to China. But we were walking around this town and we had a guy taking us and we noticed that it was very gray, even during the day. And we thought, well, maybe it's a rainy day and it's kind of gray, which it is today in Memphis. We have a gray, rainy day. And we kind of wondered about it. So we asked her, fortunately, she was bilingual. I don't speak Chinese. And she said, no, no, it's like this every day. And we said, really? You know, you don't have like sunshine, blah, 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 you know, blue skies. And then she said, no, very rarely. Um, and I, we asked, why was that? And she said they use primarily coal as fuel in Xi'an, which is a huge city, very many people. And so they always have this fog of coal dust, I guess, um, in the city. So it really can be quite significant um, depending on the number of people, depending on the amount of uh, coal that's being used. But it, um, it was really quite amazing what it had done to the atmosphere there. Again, this is some years ago. Things may have changed since I was there last in China. So who knows? Indoor pollution. Um, again, we're going to be talking some of the same words, humidity, uh, temperature, air velocity, air conditioning, and other um, things that could be indoors if you're doing construction, the chemicals used in construction. Um, of course, we worry about molds a lot now um, that may hang around indoors, especially if you have those climates where it's wet and, you know, wet, wet really wet, and it never really dries out. Um, giving you, trying to give you a little taste of uh, personal experience here. I always feel when I go to Florida, one of our states in the United States in the South, that everything smells moldy because it never really dries out there. It's always sort of um, hot and humid year round. And there seems to me at least a lot of mold. I don't want a lot of people like Florida. So, you know, hey, it's a great place. But at least from my opinion, it seems like there's a lot of mold in the indoor atmosphere. Um, and I think that can definitely lead to dry eye, itchiness and irritated eyes and even watering. Um, two syndromes that have been popularized somewhat more recently are sick building syndrome and sick house syndrome. Interestingly enough, it's hard to figure out what's causing that. Those are people who feel they've been in a building and you know, usually a, collect, a, a group of people who often work or live there and somehow feel the building itself is making them sick. It's often difficult to figure out why that's so. It's been in the news lately because people who um, American uh, uh, you know, um, workers with the, um, uh, what do you call it, with the, uh, uh, you know, for the government, government workers who were stationed in other cities have said that they felt sick in the consulate and other government related buildings in other countries, such as workers who were in government buildings, U.S. government buildings, U.S., you know, um, buildings occupied by U.S. employees in, I think, Cuba, for instance, or in some cities in Russia, said they got sick. They got nauseous and didn't feel good. They had pain um, and wondering why it happens. And actually, they don't really know. And they keep coming up with different reasons why this may have happened. Um, maybe it's um, indoor pollution. Maybe it's other issues. I would say most of the time we don't know. I'll be honest. Um, one interesting, somewhat recent event is the use of masks. As um, I'm sure you know, masks were very commonly recommended during COVID pandemic. Um, they kind of got out of the way in the United States, not too many people using them. But just because they went right you know, over the nose there, they often impacted that lower lid in the eye and led to eye irritation and um, even an ocular surface kind of problem from the mask. Um, then, of course, there's all the other issues of exposure. Smoking is one that um, is definitely a problem. People have talked about secondhand smoking and its effect on lung disease. Certainly, it can affect the eyes as well. So let's spend a few more minutes on ocular disease. I don't know how we're doing on timing. We doing we're okay? Good. Yeah, we're doing good. okay. Great. Okay. So dry eye disease is probably the most common um, ocular surface disease. Um, that we see, just point blank, but it also is the one probably most impacted by environmental exposure. 
And we've been talking about that. Pollution, urban and indoor, humidity, temperature, wind speed. Um, and we've also talked about, or at least referred to, acute episodes that may correlate with environmental stresses, says um, changes in the weather that can affect the surface. We talked a little bit, um, I don't know if it's dry eye maybe, but going to the top of Mount Everest, the air is very dry and cold, and uh, people present with a dry eye type uh, presentation. Um, uh, it's difficult to actually measure pollutants. It's difficult to measure anything in a universal fashion. Like if you're gonna measure temperature, you're gonna measure temperature while I'm sitting here in front of a computer, or you're gonna measure it in the kitchen when I'm cooking, where are you gonna measure it? And certainly that becomes even more difficult to figure out when you're measuring outdoor temperature. If I measure the temperature on a, in a parking garage downtown, it's going to be a little bit different than if I measure on the same day, same time at a um, agricultural field, maybe five or 10 miles outside of town. So which temperature is the temperature of our region? That's not so easy to figure out. So I tried to look up what is the, how common is dry eye, particularly in Nigeria. And this is a publication that was on, on uh, a review, a systematic review that was published not too long ago in 2020. And they, uh, one, you know, it has a whole lot of information, just sharing one or two points here. They estimated that in Nigeria, over 40% of the males had dry eye, and the same for females, 44% for females. That is really high. So I don't know if you're seeing a lot of dry eyes in your part oh, of the world. Or do you see it commonly? Yeah, we do. We do see a lot of dry eye disease. Yeah, interesting. So that's very high, I would say, um, when you look around the, the world. It, dry eyes is common, but not usually in that percentages. Allergies, um, I looked to try to get some pollen counts, but I was not able to find a good um, source for that. But again, that's actually pollen counts are another criteria that the government agency might produce and report each day. So those of you who like to go and get your name in print or get your name to at a, the next conference presentation might look at the pollen count in your area over the last year or months and see how it is. And then you could look at this um, environmental report and compare your results in your area of the world with other parts of the world and see how it goes. So I think that would be interesting to see what it looks like there. Um, there's certainly a growing evidence that um, ocular allergy and air pollution are correlated. Um, um, of course, allergies are gonna be affected by climate, what's growing, the humidity, the dampness, and we talked about mold, animal contact in childhood, you know, um, atopic um, history of the uh, parents. Um, this is looking at the uh, um, upper lid, the underneath part, um, and you can see these giant papillary changes that are really, on uh, this patient has got a lot of have very itchy eyes and really uncomfortable. Um, so do you see vernal and things like that in Nigeria? Oh yeah, we do see a lot of vernal, yeah. And it does yeah, have yeah. a seasonal variation. So that points to the environmental contribution as well. Yeah, do you see mainly in young, youngsters, adults, which group see, do you see the vernal in? Um, mostly in um, youngsters, um, yeah. rarely in adults, but there are a couple of um, adult patients who still have um, atopic um, keratoconductivitis, but mostly adolescent um, kids. Do you see a lot of keratoconus in your area? Oh, yeah, that's a very interesting question. Um, I would say it's been underdiagnosed. I think there's a lot more keratoconus than we are diagnosing currently. Yes, um, we're be. currently running a study um, that's looking oh, at... Nice. Uh, keratoconus across um, Nigeria and um, some other parts of Africa, but there is keratoconus. Um, again, because of late presentation, we tend not to see it in kids most often. So we tend to see it That's in individuals in their twenties, thirties, but I bet it starts in adolescent stage. You know, you might, that also would be a fun study. You can see, I like studies, right? Um, Obviously. You, you could do, um, 
you know, a case control where you went to a community, brought your auto refractor, which doesn't touch the eye, right? If you could get one that you could, you know, put on the back of a truck or something, and you could just um, look at K readings in your population. You know, it, it wouldn't give you every every diagnostic test for keratoconus, but it would be interesting to see because, of course, now we have the potential of maybe halting the changes in keratoconus with use of cross-linking. So quick diagnosis is certainly a key in controlling uh, that problem. So mm -hmm. pterygium. Um, nice picture of a pterygium here um, in an adult. You can see they have a nice arcus here, probably an age-related arcus. Nice picture. Anyway, in general, the pre prevalence is found about 10 to 12 percent. Um, as we mentioned earlier, it's higher in the warmer areas along the equator. And also sunlight is a risk factor, which gets into the high altitude people who may not be near the equator, but they're high up. And then, of course, we got that sun exposure of our people who are outdoors a lot, like our surfers, so um, which are mentioned here. So um, it's a common, um, uh, they're common risk factors. So this is from the uh, TFOS report on um, environmental influences. Um, you can see there is a report from uh, maybe from Nigeria here, relatively little actually. Um, again, um, it's interesting that there are more reports over there. I don't know why. It's an interesting thing to think about. Well, there's a lot of people in China and they like to write. So maybe that's why. I'm not sure. But we do see a lot of reports from there um, kind of thing. Um, so this is a uh, website I found, which is detailed here. Um, and I can share these slides um, with you if you'd like to look further. Um, no. But this looks at the pterygium in subterranean um, Africa. So it's not a specific area, it's a generalized, but uh, they found, um, you know, like I just said, the prevalence is about 10%, um, higher in uh, low altitudes, increase of pterygium with tropics and closer to the equator. Uh, we know about that. More sun exposure with the ultraviolet light. Um, they found another risk factor was older age, male sex, and outdoor activities. Now, when you start looking at uh, the subterranean in Africa, uh, they found the actually the number was lower than the um, worldwide number, 8.8%. Um, but in Nigeria, I thought this was pretty interesting. Male welders, people who do welding in Nigeria, had um, a higher prevalence of 17.5%. Now, I don't know how many male welders there are in Nigeria, but I might mention, though perhaps you don't, you don't want to hear this, there's a shortage of welders in the United States. So they make a lot of money in this country because uh, there are so few, relatively few of them. And I don't, I think they wear, I know they should wear protective eyewear, so maybe they don't get to Regina. I don't know. This is another weird statistic uh, that came out of this uh, particular website that I'm sharing with you. Kitchen staff in some senior high schools in Kumasi um, had a high pterygia. Go, go figure, 31%. Uh, that's pretty high. Yeah. Versus their control group of 5%. You got me. I don't know what they're cooking there. Mm. Probably they're cooking with um, natural um, shells, firewood or coal. And that might um, irritate you. Maybe your that's family. a risk factor. I yeah. don't know. Anyway, the average age in uh, subterranean Africa is 44, but the range is wide from 22 to 95. So a big range when it can occur. Um, you know, we, I don't, at least in the U.S., we don't see a lot of climatic droplet keratopathy from time to time. It's usually, sent, you know, pretty central, and that's why you see it, because it affects their vision. It's kind of gelatinous looking, these globular things across the ocular surface. Um, and it's thought to be related to environmental factors like wind, humidity, and ultraviolet light exposure. Honestly, we don't really know, but that's one of the thoughts. Um, it's relatively rare, but it has it is been associated with environmental exposure. Um, surface injury can certainly occur from industry, um, occupational issues, uh, agricultural pesticides, um, construction work where there's alkali, like in cement. But unfortunately, there's also criminal activities where people throw alkali, usually um, 
obviously because they're angry, but it might be something they have around the house for cleaning, uh, uh, plumbing and things like that. There's household exposures um, uh, and things like that. So all of them are really bad and obviously we want to avoid them if possible. Uh, uh, thermal injuries can also occur um, usually um, a little less severe than um, chemical injuries. Okay. Neoplastic diseases on the ocular surface is pictured here, uh, from neoplasia to intraepithelial changes to invasive squamous cell. Um, they do have a high recurrence rate. Uh, they do seem to be some environmental exposure issues, chronic solar radiation, cigarette smoke, smoking, um, and often they may have a pterygium as well, um, induced by the same risk factors. Um, you can also get melanomas and ultraviolet um, exposure. So um, climate changes. Uh, certainly a controversial issue these days around the world. We, are we as humans changing the climate? Can we impact the changes in the climate? Um, we're continuing to try to understand those issues, but certainly as climate changes, the environment changes, and its effect on the ocular surface can change as well. Okay, so let's go to the systematic review. Remember, we're looking at a specific question to try to get a very focused answer. For the environmental group, here's a question we looked at. What are the associations between outdoor environment pollution and dry eye disease, symptoms and signs in humans? If you do it in an organized way, as the TFOS people did, you can actually register it on Prospero which is a site that registers systematic reviews of specific questions. Can you still hear me? Oh, yes, we can. And okay. um, we have um, about, say, five minutes more. So we have about 10 minutes for questions. Yeah, I'm almost done. This is really the end of our presentation today. So they Great. looked at... Um, uh, they, they looked at all, all human reports no distinction on age, sex, country, other factors, and try to look. So what do you find? What, this is why it's a lot of work. This is a systematic review. So they looked on online um, um, search engines. And they found over 3,000 reports. Some of them were duplicates, so they could remove them pretty easily. They reviewed about 2,500 abstracts. That sounds like a lot of work to me, right? They excluded all over 2,000 of them and they ended up including 79. Why did they exclude so many over 2,000? Um, uh, some of them was, were duplicated. Some were only indoor pollution. They had no comparisons. They didn't have a dry eye diagnosis. They didn't adjust their analysis. There were all sorts of reasons that they gave here. To be honest, oh, these were not the... Uh, they didn't actually explain why they excluded these 2,000. These were additional ones they excluded. So even from the 79, they ended up with 19 studies they actually used to answer their specified question. Again, 19 studies, 10 countries. The conclusion about um, uh, pollution and dry eyes, increased dry eye disease with pollution uh, from nitrogen dioxide and carbon monoxide and soil pollution, particularly chromium, but it did not increase with particulate matter. Um, this is surprising because I told you when we discussed air pollution that we thought particulate matter would be a significant risk factor for the ocular surface. At least in the reports that they looked at the 19, they weren't able to show data that um, uh, suggested that was true. So here's another area of research um, to look for confounders, follow up over time. Uh, to separately look at dry eye diagnosis and signs and symptoms and air pollution. Definitely an area ripe for interest, especially given the um, amount of pollution air, uh, that we're all dealing with in different parts of the world, all over the world, city, mainly cities, but all over the world. So certainly I wanna end up with thanking the many uh, companies that contributed to this, um, putting together the efforts for this workshop. They didn't design the TFOS workshop. They didn't. Um, they did not have a role in what we reported, but they were the funding to allow us to put together so many people to interact and um, come up with uh, the reports that I've been sharing with you. Um, I thank you for your attention. I look forward to any comments or questions you might have. 
please make a note of my email, penny period asville at gmail.com. I'm happy to hear from any of you questions, comments. Um, and I really thank you for the opportunity to present today um, um, and thank uh, Dr. Obawani for inviting me and certainly all the participants for taking some time out of their day to join us um, at this point. So I'm gonna stop okay. sharing so we can have any questions you might have or comments. Um, um, yes, I'm so here. I'll go straight to the questions. I'll read them out sure. and then you can um, take okay. the answers. So thank you so much um, for this. This has been really interesting. I mean, we don't often talk about the environmental impact on ocular surface. Um, so I think this um, throws a lot of information for us practitioners. But more importantly, I mean, you've touched on a lot of research um, um, papers and I have like a, a whole list of stuff um, uh -huh. that I probably would email you later and we can bounce okay. off ideas. We'll talk about them. Um, yeah. So the first question um, talks about the use of insecticides is common in the agricultural sector in Africa and in homes as well um, to fight mosquitoes and things like that. Um, uh -huh. Many people describe ocular redness after exposure. Um, chronic exposition um, could be associated with um, ocular surface disease. So could you talk about some of the um, impact of um, the use of insecticides on ocular surface disease? So, you know, that's a, a great question. Um, I don't have any specific information. I'd have to look it up myself to give you if there's any statistical reports on insecticides and ocular surface. Mm. So one thing to think about before we sort of throw in the towel, as you sometimes say, um, say, hey, insecticides are bad. The other side is insecticides have a obviously a real impact on quality of life, both in growing products and also avoiding bites by, you know, mosquitoes that might be carrying malaria and other infections and things like that. So we have to look at both sides. What I would say in the agriculture area, if we could recommend using, you know, goggles or, excuse me, something to protect the eye surface, that sounds like a good idea if that's possible. So I think that might be something to look at rather than just say the insecticides are terrible, let's get rid of them. Um, they do work and there's a reason people have gone to them. So I think we have to sort of balance the good and the bad and see how we can diminish the risks as best as possible. Um, oh, I meant one thing I didn't say, which I wanna say right now, the T-Force reports are all publicly available. If you go to the website, Tear Film Ocular Surface um, uh, Society website, all of these reports can be downloaded and read, so you can look up anything you want. It's it. You do not have to have any special access to get the reports. Yeah. So um, the reports will be made available um at the end of the webinar series and um, with the links and the recordings and everything. Um. So thank you for that. Um. I just add um another question to that. Um. Sure. When there's an exposure to um insecticides, um, what kind of ocular surface disease are you expecting to see as a clinician from the clinical perspective? I think you're mainly going to be see a staining of the ocular surface, staining mm -hmm. and redness, you know, right. kind of things. So I think the chief complaint is going to be burning mm -hmm. um, and irritation, you yep. know, and that's what you're going to see. So probably like other chemical, we're talking about a chemical irritant, the chemical we're talking about in insecticides, probably using artificial tears, if extreme rinsing the eye would be useful, you know. Um, um, thing, the, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, um, the... Um, question ends with um, sort of trying to make a correlation between chronic exposure to insecticides and um, autoimmune conditions like Sjogren syndrome. Do you think there is an association there? You know, that is really hard. So we yeah. see Sjogren's in, in almost every population. So, mm -hmm. so question is, when you get those auto, um, systemic autoimmune diseases as Sjogren's is, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. why does it happen? You know, it's really the same question we ask ourselves about cancer. And as time goes on, we start seeing, at least in the cancer industry, in that industry, in cancer research, that um, maybe viruses are more important than we thought in altering the response and allowing cancers to grow. So we're starting to see more of that. Not a lot, but more of that. So now we see it with, um, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, um, Epstein Barr virus with certain cancers. Uh, there's, you know, there's a couple of cancers now have particular viral exposures that may be the T to 
getting the process going and it can be many years before they get the cancer. So when you get to something like Sjogren's, you got to wonder also whether there's been something that's sort of gotten it going, which is not necessarily temporarily related to when you make the clinical diagnosis. And I don't know. So is it environmental? I don't know. Cause I, you know, they, they, we see it in different parts of the world and they certainly have different environments. So I'm not sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so the next question um, talks about sick um, building um, syndrome or sick house syndrome, which you did Yeah. mention um, at the course of your presentation. Um, so it's sort of a fairly new um, term. Um, so could you um, throw more light on it? So here's the, the thing. When it, the way that the sick building syndrome is primarily uh, thought of is individuals, a cluster of individuals who work in a specific building have similar complaints, similar new complaints, new headaches, new nausea, that cannot be explained any other way. And so they think, well, maybe it's some exposure within the building. And sometimes, depending on the number of people and the location of the event, they'll go, if it's in a school or something, they'll go and see if there's something unusual about the air or the atmosphere within that building. But most of the time, they can't find anything. So that maybe we're not looking for the right thing, or maybe um, that's not what's causing the problem. Who knows? But it definitely comes up. And then usually it's a hot period of news where they tell us all about it. The you know, kids at this school have this kids and teachers all complaining of similar symptoms. Um, and then they investigate, they don't come up with anything, and then it seems to go away um, and stop happening. So I don't know. I, I, I think a lot of times we don't know. Um, but these uh, um, these are still, you know, troubling and uh, events that we need to think about um, and to continue to explore. All right. Um, so the next question looks at something that's quite controversial, and I'm I'm very interested in hearing your answer. I like controversy. Oh, okay. So do blue blocking lenses offer better UV protection compared to normal transition of photochromic lenses? Uh, you know, blue blocking lenses, lots of evidence on that, lots of lots of research. I don't consider myself an expert, but there does seem to be some evidence that they're useful. So, um, you know, to the grievous, I'm going to, some of these points, you've got great questions and this many, many page document. I'm not sure I have all the answers for you. I apologize. So together, we're going to have to search the uh, TFOS report and see if we can get some specific things. So um, one of the things that TFOS tried to do was gather the evidence. And what do we mean by evidence? For something to be evidence, and I want you to think about it when you plan your research, you can't just sort of present it, you got to write it down, because then other people can read it and review it and think about it in relationship to what they know and what they see. So um, I'm going to take a look at what the evidence is on all, on write all, I wrote all these factors down, maybe I'll get an email together, you and I will get an email together that we can respond to some of these, because I'll be apologize. I don't want to say something that I can't back up with the evidence. Well, I think I think you're right on um, the um, talk about um, blue blocking lenses is quite controversial. Interestingly, um, Professor um, James will be doing on the day seven. We'll be talking about the digital environment, and I think he's going to Oh, touch good. on that topic as well. Okay. Um, also, one of the people in the committee, um, Sumir Singh, um, he was also um, at Sicily. Um, his PhD work was centered on the effect of blue blocking lenses on um, um, digital eye strain and the symptoms and dry eyes and things like that. Right. Yeah. And well, he did, um, his team published um, a meta-analysis. Um, I think that came out last week. And um, the, um, well, I, I'd say the jury is still out there, but his conclusion was blue blocking lenses do not help with digital eye strain. So, um, Yeah, yeah. I think I saw that report, but you, you know, we'll have yeah, you have to you know, it's hard, always hard to tell. What exactly. so here's the, just let me take a one thought about research. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, one a famous surgeon once said, "When I do surgery, I want it to be so good that nobody else can reproduce it because I'm so special and so good at it. When I do research, I want everybody to be able to reproduce it because that shows it's real." So one of the things about research, one one report, one review doesn't answer the whole question. We Exactly. want more people to do it. So it doesn't always give the answer. You know, you have Yeah. to look. At it. Um, and Absolutely. it doesn't mean one or the other was wrong. There's obviously a lot of variation in the world, you know. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah.
All right, so the next question um, from the same person um, asks, how was Terry Jum treated in the past um, before um, surgeries? Any idea? Uh, before surgeries, it's been like in my lifetime, it's definitely a surgical, if, if it impacts vision, it's Mm-hmm. a surgical approach. Um, Mm-hmm. I don't know. That's a good question. But quite honestly, I thought you were going to ask the question, which is equally important. How do, how should we do the surgery? If you ask 10, 10 I was going to ask that. Mm -hmm. how to do, they do the, how do they do their pterygium surgery? 10 people trained at 10 different places. They have 10 methods of doing it. So I think one of the unknowns we have actually is how best to do it to prevent recurrences after surgery. And I don't think we have the answer. I'll be honest. Yeah, but in your experience, I mean, I know there are different variations with amniotic membrane grafts or conjunctival Yes. autografts and things like that. But in your experience, would you, which, Um, and I know um, also the use of mitomycin C, which may also pose some toxicity to the ocular surface. Um, in your experience, or from maybe what's published in literature, which would you say is the most um, least toxic and the most toxic um, um, method from this I've mentioned? I would say that in the early days, what they used to do is bare sclera, meaning you remove the pterygium and do beta radiation, which is a localized um, uh, radiation that you could just apply a probe in that area of the eye. And it didn't work too well. Okay. I don't think we got that much toxicity as long as you didn't put the probe too long, but it didn't work. Um, Yeah. so recurrences seem a big problem. And I would say the mitomycin, if used correctly, does decrease the recurrence. The key is not to put the mitomycin on the bare sclera, but under, under the conjunctiva where the tenons is. Because it's usually, I mean, thinking now, a mechanism is it's the tenons that aggressively grows back, making a new pterygium and new scarring. Um, so I still use mitomycin if it's an aggressive pterygium in small amounts, small period of time under the conjunctiva. Um, but some people will never use it. They don't like it. In terms of covering that bare sclera, the, um, most people, and I would say I'm included, um, like to use a bit of the patient's own conjunctiva, an autograft, because um, it's least toxic and it works pretty well. However, sometimes you don't have enough tissue, and that's when we might use an amniotic membrane, which, of course, is preserved and is available. So, yeah, I think, I, frankly, I think pterygiums are fascinating as... Uh, in terms of how best to treat them and how the, why it happens. It's almost like a localized stem cell deficiency, which is kind of unusual. Why do you get it in one spot? Is it ultraviolet hitting that one spot? I don't know. You know, but I think it has a lot of um, opportunity to explore both its etiology and best treatment. And I think the, the, the jury is definitely still out in understanding it. Yeah. Thank So you for it's that um, answer. definitely an area Um, that will be research. sure. So the next question, um, so this one starts by saying um, the graphical representations, um, looking at the analysis of the UV levels by month and the years um, was very much appreciated. So thank you so much for that. Um, do you by any chance or can you um, by any chance provide um, UV level variation um, with time of the day and how would that affect the ocular surface? Well, I think there is variation. Obviously, the sun varies throughout the day, right? Um, did you, you didn't get the uh, total eclipse in Africa, did you, this week? Yeah. No, we didn't. Okay. Did that get publicity in Africa, the total eclipse? Oh, well, Yeah. I guess for those who um, on social media, Even bigger. um, CNN and <laughs> all that, uh, yeah, it yeah, was yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know. I must have been a slow news day. It was all over the news here. So it did, it did cover here. We had 98%. Um, eclipse where the sun was blocked out 98% by the moon. Um, so obviously that was an extreme variation, but um, certainly it varies. So, uh, so you know, when we did um, our environmental impact on dry eyes as part of our dream big clinical trial, and I could send that paper to you if you'd like, um, Sure. the, uh, what, all that data came from public sources. So we, we had 27 sites. We looked at each site when the patients were seen, the UV exposure, then all that kinds of stuff. So I think you're going to find there's more information than you that you may be surprised about that's collected and um, publicly available.
you know, so I would look at the UV information. And honestly, yeah. I'll send you the paper and feel free to share it with your participants. Um, sure. It may, I don't remember exactly how they found all the information, but you may want to um, take a look what they did. Obviously, the United States may have different methodologies in Africa, but I wouldn't be surprised if some of those techniques could be applied in your area of the world as well, in terms of getting the data. Yeah. So Thank I'm, so I'm going to send you the paper. And then, yeah, I'll, um, I'll, I'll, look, then I'll look up for that. Yeah, um, and so, it might be worth looking I, at their technique. Yeah, so I do have some questions of my own. Um, so the two questions, actually, I have a lot, but I just, um, for time's sake, I'll just ask two questions. Sure. So the first one is, um, I mean, the first um, lecture series was on contact lenses and the impact on the ocular surface. But what uh -huh. we don't often talk about is how disposal of contact lenses can affect the environment and how that may in turn affect um, other conditions. So do you think um, that contact lens or even aside contact lens disposal, it could also be... Um, post-surgery materials or the disposables that we use and the way we dispose them, do you think that contributes to um, environmental pollution or climate change? And can that have some effect? Well, are you putting this on Twitter or X when we're done? To let me know. <laughs> okay. That's a very hot topic, as you well know. Sure. There's a big controversy now about plastics. Uh, we all use a lot of them, uh, mm -hmm. not just contact lenses, but, uh, you know, uh, um, my bottle of soda here and um, other places. So we have them all over the place, right? Uh -huh. um, yeah, you have one too. So um, uh, so there's a lot, there, and that's a growing area of data. So one thing, um, you know, the, you know, it's kind of interesting and I, you know, it's hard to evaluate that. So here's the thing. When you're, if I'm funded to do research on the effect of plastics on the ocular surface, you know, I'm going to find a lot of things that correlate kind of, because that's sort of what I'm looking for. Yeah. Um, and and probably the data I'm finding, if I'm honest, is true, but it may still end up having some biases that I'm not aware of. For instance, I went to visit, um, and I like to throw in my personal sort of experiences here. I went to visit Alaska about two years ago, and um, you, maybe you don't remember it some years ago, but there was a huge oil spill in one area of Alaska, like Valdez um, oil spill. It was just huge. It was, you know, went all over the, you know, everybody talked about it. And, you know, they went and tried to save birds and everything because there was oil all over the place. Well, now it's many years later. I forget. It may even be 20 years or something. It's been a long time. I don't remember when it happened. And the place is booming. There's lots of plants, there's lots of fish, there's lots of everything. So nature is pretty good to us. So even things that we do badly, and we do, as, as people, we do pollute and we do things we shouldn't do, we're actually, nature's pretty good at helping us um, um, uh, get back on our feet, so to speak. So before we throw stop making everything out of plastic, we should kind of think about it seriously. So I don't like extreme changes just because um, you can make a headline out of it because it may not be the whole story, but it is a very hot area. It definitely is. And one of them is contact lenses. So I don't have an answer for you, but it's very hot. You know, everybody's talking about plastic and the other areas they're talking about eye surgery and the amount of disposable stuff we have, which is huge. Um, on the other hand, if you're the patient and they use less disposables because they don't want to, it costs too much or too much waste and you get the eye infection, you kind of wish they use more sterile stuff. So you, you got to weigh the good and the bad, right? Yeah, I totally agree. Um, mm -hmm. My next question um, looks at um, sort of a combination mm -hmm. of factors. I mean, we will be looking at um, a webinar on um, um, elective procedures, um, like refractive surgery and how that kind of impacts the ocular surface. Um, but after surgery, post-surgery, no patients experience dry eye disease. And sometimes these are patients who want to enjoy their new vision. They want to travel. They want to probably go mountain climbing and things like that. Given um, the fact that some extreme temperature changes or weather changes or humidity changes may affect the cornea or the ocular surface, would you say that you recommend uh, patients who've just had refractive surgery um, abstain from such um, activities, mountain climbing, travel, and things like that? 
Sure. So we want our anybody who and typically it's a, what we call in the United States a self pay procedure. Um, they want a perfect result and an excellent result, as we always do with any patient as providers. But here's the story: almost every refractive surgery, whether it's LASIK or a surface procedure, um, um, is going to experience some ocular surface discomfort and even findings at slit lamp examination. I would say there are two key things to think about. One. Make sure you've done a very thorough exam before the surgery to um, be sure they do or don't have dry eyes or ocular surface disease before you get started. If they do, one, treat them. And if you can't get rid of it, they may not be a good candidate for a, an elective procedure. Um, and two, even if their surface looks pristine, no staining, long tear breakup time, et cetera, um, you need to explain in advance that almost everybody experiences some signs and symptoms of dry eye afterwards. In most patients, it subsides over a couple of weeks to months, but there is a small proportion, and we don't know why, that it persists, okay? So if you're gonna give them a good informed consent, which is definitely worth doing, you gotta bring that up. It's not a zero um, event. Um, how long you should tell them? It's more that they gotta keep up the lubrication. Yeah. One of the, let me just add, just add a point on lubrication. You know, typically when we have our dry patients, we pick up, actually, here's a bottle. We pick up a bottle and we say, hey, try this. It'll help your eyes, okay? Mm -hmm. Happen to have a bottle right here. Um, what we don't tell them is how to use it. So think about any other medication you get from an, um, your physician or your provider. They tell you an antibiotic, take it twice a day. Take it four times a day. They tell you exactly how to use it. We don't do that with artificial tears. I think that's a mistake. We did a small study to show that if you tell people how to take it four times a day before they have pain, before they have significant discomfort, they actually do better than if you say, wait till it really bothers you. So with our post-refractive or post-surgical patients, instead of waiting for them to come back and complain to you, say, here's a bottle or get a bottle, use it X times a day um, for the next month or so. Um, you know, give a, give a time thing, give a recommendation rather than wait for them to complain. Yeah. Thank you so much for that. Um, so my next point is not a question. This will be my closing um, statement. You did mention um, the impact of um, polling, um, the polling count or particle matter count. Um, could you um, say from the TFOS report, um, what ocular surface disease specifically would you say is related to maybe the polling count or um, the particulate matter? Um, because I'm trying to take down notes for something that may be future research. I'll circle back with you. Sure, sure. Okay, so for pollen, we're usually talking about allergy. Mm -hmm. um, and for particular matter, the PM, we're usually talking more sort of a dry eye kind of thing, more mm -hmm. just irritation. So um, the, the thing that makes everything complicated as uh, so much in the world is, um, we think there is a large percentage of the dry eye population, we call them dry eye, actually has a, a proportion of that is really allergy. So it's I not agree. necessarily two distinct things. They kind of cross over. You know how we like to make those Venn diagrams with those circles, yeah. they cross over a little bit. So it's not one or the other. So you're going to see some crossover on uh, both ways. Those who get more pollen exposures and those who get more pollution exposure, you're gonna see both. Um, but I think that, that those are definitely interesting research questions to understand better and to to uh, you know to, to figure out best how it, uh, to approach in terms of diagnosis and treatment. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, this has been really interesting. Um, for the participants, we thank you for your time. Um, enjoy the rest of your day, Dr. Penny. We're so grateful to have you here. Yeah, well, thank you for inviting me. I hope I have a chance to meet you at future meetings or opportunity to visit Africa in the future. But I really appreciate the chance to talk and share some of the Environmental Committee from TFOS and all the work they did. So thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so if you want to write to Dr. Penny, you may um, write um, via her email. Yeah. Um, right. Reach out to her if you have further questions. And you can see she's very keen um, to research, so reach out to her. I'm sure she'll be happy to um, give you some clarification. Also remember to fill out the TFOS um, dry practice survey. Um, those will be sent to the emails. And if you're interested in um, the TFOS due, um, due three 
conference happening in Italy in October. Um, you can check out the TFOS website and um for more information. Um, enjoy the rest of your evening, everyone, and um, enjoy the rest of your day, Dr. Penny. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. So have a good day for everybody or good evening. Bye-bye. Yeah. Thank you so much. Bye.